Skinny Corp Guide to the Do First Work Ethic. So we started about nine years ago, and um, we're going to talk about the past nine years and how, our, how the way that we got things done changed over that time period, because we started as a personal project, and we never intended really for this to, to grow to the size that it is today. So the way that we did things has changed significantly since the beginning. So we thought that would be interesting for you guys to hear. Um, so normally, uh, we do these intro screens where we show who we are. Um, and we thought that this one would be uh, particularly relevant because uh, we took these pictures of ourselves at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, a couple of versions ago when we were working on Threadless. And um, it, I just felt that it was pretty indicative of uh, what our work style is like. Um, we tend to not be very serious. Uh, we definitely take time out to um, take really dumb pictures. And actually, I think during the course of that night, um, we, have a, we have a blow dart gun in our office, yeah. like everyone does. And um, <laughs> we decided it would be a good idea to go outside and shake up cans of soda and shoot blow darts at them. So that was immediately following these pictures. So uh, it's just kind of, uh, you know, we're trying to frame how we work, which, um, which kind of, you know, goes into this. Um, normally, when we're asked to speak, we get, uh, we, we, we do the whole, you know, the, the what, right? So um, we, really, we really didn't want to focus on the what, because if you're interested in the what, um, there's, there's lots of things online that you can find out about us. Um, this is actually the first office. Where, that's not like a picture we found on the internet. This is my apartment in 2000, and I literally would take my computer and put it in front of the front door so that I would not leave. And <laughs> I would just work like nonstop, just making this stuff happen. And it was just for fun, you know. I wasn't trying to even build a business. This was just like I love making websites and I love being a member of art communities online. And um, it was just a really fun time. 2000 to 2004 was kind of the period where we had no idea that Threadless had the potential that it had. And so the reasons for us doing the work was. Um, just to do something fun and exciting for other people that we knew. And, um, you know, I was, from 2000 to 2002, I was working a full-time job. I was going to school part-time. I uh, did not take a penny of any sale that came in um, of a t-shirt. Every penny that came in, I used to print more t-shirts. And uh, by 2002, we realized that we could build websites for clients, and, go, and we actually quit our jobs. and. Uh, went off on our own and started a company that built websites for clients. We didn't, we didn't leave our jobs to, to do Threadless. Um, so right, 2002 that, to 2004, was, was, we were working on our own. Right. Yeah, I mean, 2002 is actually where I came in, because um, we were both working. We were friends, but we were both working separate jobs. And um, when he left his job, I uh, was laid off and decided to just go and work uh, in their office. So, I mean, we really focused on, you know, me coming from the agency world, I was lucky enough to uh, become friends with some of the guys who own the agency who also decided to leave after the small agency that I was a part of was acquired. Um, so we really just kind of like, we worked for every agency and at the time, um, you know, our, our focus and working on Threadless um, was kind of twofold. Like one, we wanted to sort of like maintain the community and keep things moving along. But at the same time, it also served to prove to our potential clients that we could build e-commerce websites, that we knew how to use Flash, like all of these sort of things. So it became like a working model. So, you know, it was, it was becoming this business by accident. So, um, you know, sort of like what Jake was saying earlier is this, this entire time, this, is, this was a total just fun personal side project for everyone involved. Yeah. So the next slide, this was one thing that um, we noticed in thinking back, you know, we weren't um, making changes to Threadless based on, you know, we think that if we make this change, we could sell more t-shirts or anything like that. It was 100% reactive to what the community wanted. So, you know, it was completely a community project. So if people were saying, um, I think that you guys need to print on this t-shirt over this t-shirt, we would absolutely do that, no questions asked. It was just um, trying to be the coolest thing that we could be for the community. That's Absolutely. And this, and this actually was a period of time that we kind of like started to really get uh, catch our stride in our kind of like get shit done attitude um, because we didn't really need Threadless to do anything for us. Um, it wasn't paying our bills. Um, it wasn't getting us attention. It was basically serving to just be this cool thing for this small group of people. And, you know, it grew and stuff like that. But really there was no... Um, 
there were no clear-cut consequences of what would have happened if we would have had some like radical idea and just decided to you know completely change the idea of the site. Um, so we really, so you know, like that says, we really learned to be 100% reactive to um, our own ideas. So yeah, d don't know how to do it, work it out. I mean, this is like I'm a web designer and I know a little bit about programming, but we make T-shirts, and you know, I did that by myself in the, in the beginning, working out of my apartment, and um, you know, the way that I guess if I, I had this idea, you know, I want to make T-shirts but I knew nothing about it, I was 20 years old. And um, so the way I did it is I just opened up the phone book and found a screen printer locally. And you know, there was no, I guess it's just important to note that there was like no fear in um, trying to figure things out. It was just, I had the confidence to kind of like say, okay, I don't know how to do this, but I need to figure it out and just do it. Um, there was things from like, from printing t-shirts, from processing credit card numbers, to like shipping orders, all these kind of things we just figured out as we went. In the beginning, we actually processed our credit card numbers over the phone because that's the only way I could, like I Googled, if Google was even the, the search then, I don't know. <laughs> but I, fig I found out how you could actually like, you could call a 1-800 number, type in the credit card number, and it would charge their account. So. I mean, so this was really started, I mean, my background's in print design. I was not a web designer. Um, I became a web designer because I built a website to showcase my print work, and everyone said, wow, that's a great website. And nobody said anything about the print work. So, <laughs> so I, was, I was like, okay, well, I guess I can do this. Um, so I started playing around with it, but um, you know, a lot of the tools, and being an early web designer um, meant that I needed to sort of, I knew early on that I needed, if I was gonna work with programmers, that I needed to at least understand what they were doing. So part of me learning how to be a web designer was, you know, tackling O'Reilly, HTML, CSS, PHP books. I mean, basically times, I, I mean, I had no idea what I was reading. But I was working my way through it all, so at least I could understand it so I can learn to design for it. I mean, and that was my Friday nights, it was my Saturday nights, it was, you know, any time. Like, I was not going out, I was not hanging out with friends, I was just getting it done. And that was just a period of time that it was, it was important for me to just work it out, because I knew that, my choices were figure this out or go back to kind of agency hell, which I really was not going to, um, well, I wasn't going to do that. When I was, uh, actually go back, because when I was 16, um, my dad got his prodigy dial-up internet. And uh, my first thing that I kind of did, like within the first week of having this, is I went to a website and I'm like, how the hell did people do this? And I just was playing around with all the menus and I found view source. And that's how I learned HTML was just, um, I, I guess the curiosity of figuring out how, to, how these things work. Um, and then I, right after that, just went door to door to all the businesses in my, in my city and asked if they wanted me to make them a website for free in 1996. So things started to change for the company in 2004, 2006. The biggest change is that um, January of 2004, we fired all of our clients. Um, we kind of knew throughout 2003 that uh, we needed to do something because we were competing for our own time um, by working on Threadless full time and taking on projects full time and it was kind of a scary notion where no clients generally equals no money. So fired everyone, gave the good ones to our friends who were starting small things and this became, 2004 was a year that we were on our own. Um, so we kind of wanted to talk about how, like what changed uh, between 2004 to 2006. So yeah, we started to uh, realize that Threadless has this huge potential. This was also around the time that MIT asked us to come speak to a group of people, and we learned that there's words for what we were doing, like user innovation and crowdsourcing and all these things. So, and we were looking at Threadless, and we were actually seeing significant, you know, revenue stream coming in, and thinking that this is like something that we could actually do the rest of our lives. <laughs> yeah, this was, um, uh, the the MIT thing was interesting. Um, particularly because this is a period of time where we just kept our heads down and worked. Um, especially to, right in the beginning of 2004, it was like gung-ho, all threadless. And then MIT's like, hey, come and talk to us about threadless. And we're just like, okay, you know, we didn't really know what to expect. We showed up there. Um, we were expected to give a presentation because apparently that's an expectation when you get asked to speak, um, <laughs> which, was, uh, which we didn't know. Um, so Eric Von Hippel from MIT, um, he's a brilliant guy, and he in introducing us, um, told everyone what we did, <laughs> which was good, because we wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, so we kind of went from there and started realizing that a lot of the things that 
you know, we worked in a way that made sense for us. We didn't know how to do things, so we just went ahead and did them. Um, we didn't try and look for answers. I think it was to our benefit that we didn't go to business school or we weren't in art school for very long because we, did, we really didn't have this basis of knowledge that said, I need to get this done, so here's the way I learned how to do it. It was just, all right, well, we're staying up all night and we're gonna figure this one out. So, so we actually sort of fell into um, what they called at the time user innovation, which Jeff Howe went on to coin the term crowdsourcing. Um, so we were doing uh, you know, crowdsourcing and a lot of applying a lot of these like web 2.0 principles just because it made sense to us. And it wasn't, this wasn't like on paper, some brilliant business plan and you know, like, yes, we we're gonna take over the world with this piece of paper that has brilliant ideas. I mean, we just kind of like rocked it and it just happened to sort of coincide with something that was already going on. So we're a real company and we need real help. I guess another reason why we needed to get proactive is we were starting to see the company kind of grow f faster than we can uh, keep up with it. Um, so an example of that would be, I think in uh, December of 05, we had a Christmas sale and we sold so many t-shirts that it, it would take you a month before we'd ship your order because we were just so bogged down in orders. and. Um, you know, so we need to get proactive about these things. We need to say, okay, if we do, if our Christmas sale is, is, is this successful, we need to be set up to be able to ship those orders. And, you know, we, we didn't really feel like we could do it 100% on our own, and we didn't want to just outsource everything. So um, we were looking at getting somebody else invested in the company who could kind of help us out with these things. And along the way of... Um which, because that, because uh, that sort of like leads into the last part. But um, along the way, you know, we realized there was three of us, and we had a couple of people helping us um, part time shipping orders. But this was an interesting time in our company. And and if any uh, of you guys have companies that were smaller and then grew a little bit, is you start to realize how many things you try and accomplish all by yourself, and and you start peeling off portions of your job that fill full time jobs, and those people are busy. And you realize that you could like peel off all these layers and it doesn't make you any less busy. You could just focus more. And then these other people can focus on those things. So you realize that as you start to hire more people, you realize how little focus you could give to every single thing. So um, you know, this was a time that we weren't answering customer service emails by ourselves anymore because we were like, hey, maybe we should hire somebody to deal with the 500 emails that come in per day you know, for customer service on top of all of the other emails that we had to deal with. So basically, at, you know, at this point, we probably had like 20 people, maybe a little bit less, um, and things were starting to get uh, you know, pretty busy. But the one thing that we really wanted to like, keep in mind at the time was keeping it simple and doing it ourselves. Um, I, well, I mean, you should yeah. talk about building the stuff. Yeah, you know, even when we were hiring and stuff, we, weren't, we, we were always kind of in this mindset where we can do it. You know, even though it's just it's not me personally doing it all, we can do it ourselves and figure it out. And even our so our fulfillment software in our warehouse, we wrote ourselves. We don't use third-party software for hardly anything at all. Um, we we just and we figure out all these like interesting way to do ways to do things that we realize are just not the way things are done. Um, but which, we learned, which creates a problem, though I will say, yeah. in the times that we do need to integrate with third-party software. We get those reps in, and they're like, "What the hell is going on here?" Because but we are we built... optimized for shipping T-shirts. Like yeah. our warehouse is just—I mean, it, it's it's pretty sweet right now. Because <laughs> we did it ourselves, and we know what our own problems are, so we can solve them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always worth your effort to. Um, well, obviously, it's worth your effort to keep things uncomplicated. But doing it yourself, I mean. The only time that I would really ever have somebody else do it for me is if it was so far outside of my ability or skill set that I knew that me being a part of it would actually be a detriment to the project. Otherwise, um, I, I mean, there's plenty of time in the day to get things done. Um, weekends are just days that you don't technically have to go to work, like physically be at your job. It doesn't mean you can't be working. You know, this is still to this day stuff that we do. I mean, I still work on weekends. The company's almost 10 years old at this point. Um, because I, we don't want to hire extra people to do the work that we can get done because it just keeps it, the more people you have, and we were learning this, we're almost at like 60 people now, um, it gets complicated and you, you spend time worrying about the operations of your company and not as much time focusing on actually working. So doing it yourself is a super important thing. It's a good, good takeaway. But there were some problems during this time. When we realized what we were doing, um, <laughs> 
with Threadless, we also and we and we fired all our clients. We also saw opportunity to do it on in different ways. So we started up like a music project. We started up a uh, drink recipe. Drink recipe website. Yeah. We started up a, a pattern, which is still around today, and it's pretty cool. Nakedandangry.com. We started up a, a bumper sticker company for people <laughs> who uh, park poorly. They're low tax stickers that say "I park like an idiot," and you can put them on other people's cars. So when we fired our clients, we thought, you know, we oh, we're going to focus on threadless full time and and do this. But then we started sprouting up all these other projects, which I think were were really good for us to to do, and we still are doing them today. But um, I think we had a little bit too large of ambitions. Yeah, um, it, I mean, and that's, and that's sort of like is telling of, um, you know, your work practices. Um, we were in client mode. So once we didn't have any clients anymore, it, working on Threadless full time felt completely unnatural. It's sort of like, I don't know about you guys, but like I can't go on vacation. Like I can't relax. I can't turn my brain off. So, we're, you know, only having one, going down to one project it was like, this is impossible. We need to create more things to do, you know, because we didn't take the time to look at Threadless and see what can we do. We were just looking at the current size of the project and saying, we've got all this great time. And like, hell, let's, let's crowdsource everything. So, um, yeah, so we became our worst enemy. But I think the positive of that is a couple of the projects failed. Um, and I think that was really good for us because when you do client work, failure is kind of catastrophic. So you really do everything you can do to not fail. When you're working on your own projects, failure is awesome. Um, and we didn't realize that until 15 megs of fame, which is our music project, failed. Um, and you know, you realize you put a ton of time, a ton of energy, money, because you're obviously getting paid um, a salary. And it, when you realize you've you basically got checkmated, and there's just nothing you can do except for you know stop the project, you learn so much. And I think that you know learning from failure is just such an important thing. So when you're working on your own projects, you know, like don't aff don't be afraid to kind of like go out on a limb on certain projects because if they do fail, you're going to end up learning a ton from it anyways. Kind of how we do things now, and this is including 2006 when we took a minority investment, not because we needed money, but because we were making a lot of money and we're not able to keep the business um, in sort of like this growing mode without crushing under our own weight because we, in a lot of respects, had no idea what we were doing. Um, so we really needed to kind of like tap into this network from our, um, from our investors. So so they bought into us, and we benefited from all of their business uh, expertise. Um, so you know about getting real, realistic and staying scrappy is there's a lot of things that we've done since 2006 up until now. We've um, Jake stepped down as CEO, um, which was a realistic decision because um, I mean I don't think that Jake could be a CEO at, <laughs> at any other company any other company. So it made sense to bring in a CEO. Um, we've since hired a VP of operations, a VP of marketing, people who actually belong in a company our size. But if you come and hang out at our company, you could line every single person in a row and you would have no idea who anybody was. Because the idea is that we're still a scrappy company. We hire people that fit within our company. And we need to remember how we worked in 2004 and 2002 and kind of had that like, let's just get shit done attitude. Yeah, we still, that's the one thing that has really spanned the entire period that we've been in business is the, the get it done attitude, you know, and it kind of speaks to the scrappiness of just like figuring out what you need to do and just moving forward with it. Don't like over negotiate every point and, you know, debate whether or not it's going to return so much, you know, I mean, I guess kind of uh, like, Figure out what is realistic to do. I mean, put a little bit of thought into that, but then just do it. And then um, this, kind of, this came from our VP of operations, which has been like our mantra this year, which is brutal prioritization and maniacal focus, which is, um, which is sort of our way of saying, let's just get real and look at the stuff that we're doing and see what stuff works and see what stuff doesn't. And we're just going to go through it like with a machete. And the stuff that isn't working, we just need to pull the plug on so we, can, so we have that time. Because even as a 60-person company, you know, there's... There's companies that we know that, are, that have projects our size and teams three times the size. So in staying scrappy and still wanting to do a lot of things ourselves, we really, really need to get um, you know, brutal with how we prioritize um, our tasks. So that's what the machine guns are about. Like coming up with a reason list is a creative process. And it's really easy, um, like Seth was talking about, like others were talking about, it's really easy to come up with a list of a million reasons why it's, you're just not ready to, to get it done. And you just need to take that first step. because if you have that list of a million reasons that it's not ready, by taking that first step, that list is going to turn into a million ways to make it better. And it's, 
we will always take that first step. Even if the first thing that we release, we're like, wow, this sucks. You know, because that's okay, because we're gonna start to get feedback from people, and that creates a sense of urgency, because by pushing it forward, you're just never gonna get it done, and then you're wasting time coming up with all the reasons why you haven't taken that first step. So taking that first step is, is super important. And uh, thanks for listening. Yeah.